Hey everybody, my name is Dustin Mahaffey, and uh, I probably don't know this, but I fix MacBooks. Um, it has been probably about over a year since I made my last video, um, so I figured I'd make one on a MacBook repair. So today we have an 8200850 that came in. Uh, when it came in, I initially plugged it in. I got uh, 5 volts and 500 milliamps, which tells me right away eh, something's not right. Uh, normally, what you get is like 60, 256, somewhere around there, and then it kind of goes up to the 20 volt, 20 volt mark, uh, and then kind of builds up from there. Uh, normally, you do not get 5 volt, 500 milliamp right away. So what I did was uh, I went ahead and opened up the uh, MacBook and. Uh, what I noticed was one of the uh, CD chips had been removed and uh, the area was looking pretty bad. Uh, so all I've done currently is ultrasonic the board to try to get some of the flux off from the prior technician who had worked on this. Um, so uh, we'll go ahead and jump right in. So I'm going to go switch you over to the scope here and let you guys take a look at what we got going on. All right, so what you see is my ultrasonic uh, did not do a very good job. Maybe uh, you'll have my scope. All right, sorry about that. I had to start over because uh, my scope camera's acting weird. Anyway, so as I was saying, the only thing I've done to this board is ultrasonic it to kind of get all the flux off the board. You can see it did not do a very good job. There's still a bunch of flux over here. Um, and also you can see several damaged pads um, all over here damaged. That one's missing. That one's probably in no stuff. Um, one over here, down here is missing, um, and you'll see a data choke right on the corner uh, is not there, and I believe this is a capacitor, uh, maybe another capacitor. We'll have to check the board view. This resistor is just barely hanging on. It's actually kind of kicked up. Oop. See if I can make that in focus for you. Kicked up a little bit there, uh, so that's no good. We'll have to fix that. Uh, this is kind of um, slanted so uh, really what we're gonna have to do here is essentially rebuild the circuit in order to get to our initial issue um, because even with the missing CD3215 on the board you will not get 5 volt and 500 milliamp again that's way too high that tells me right away there's a short on the board somewhere uh, so let's go ahead and get started the, like I said mentioned the first thing I'm gonna do is um, if I can figure out how to use uh, OBS, is the first thing I'm gonna do is go ahead and clean up this area and make it look like it should, uh, and then we will move on to the rest. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and wick the uh, pads here. And grab some wick. And my voice is a little nasally. I've been uh, sick all weekend, so I'm trying to get over that. So the iron's hot, we are ready to go. And we're just gonna try to wick some of these pads. Now we might uh, end up tearing another one um, just because some of these are just barely hanging on like that one I touched earlier, just fully on removed. That's okay, we're gonna have to lay jumpers anyway. Uh, so let's go ahead and get all this cleaned up, looking good. Now the reason that we got torn pads here is because this is one of the models uh, that actually um, have underfill around the uh, CD3215 so it makes it more of a pain to remove so I can see where the tech kind of messed up there uh, he, he did when I talked to him about it he said uh, it was a pain and I was like yeah well it takes practice uh, so now we're gonna clean up the remaining amount of underfill you're just gonna lower our hot air uh, for this I use about like 250 and 70 airflow uh, as long as it's not too hot it doesn't really matter uh, one thing you'll see though which is remarkable is they didn't float the Hall effect sensor I'm surprised about that that thing's actually super easy to float um, so let's go ahead and we're gonna clean up this underfill now and I'm using a 007 blade the Kwame 007 blade this is one of my favorite blades for removing underfill very easy to work with too deep if I can. We're just going to scrape all this away here, as far away from back as from the chip as we can. Get the stuff off in the center here. Alright. Be 
beautiful. All right, we've got some excess solder right there on that cat. We'll remove that also. All right. So now that we got all the underfill gone, what we're gonna do here is uh, we are gonna use some UV glue to kind of make this look nicer. But first, let's fix some of these pads. All right, come over here. Move a little bit over. There you go. Just like that. That one's good. Um, so let me let me go ahead and get some UV going here. UV mask. Now I'm going to be using UV mask. It, it's a, a mask that you put on the logic board uh, to go ahead and kind of try to cover up the some of the solder or the open exposed pads. So we're going to get hit some of it down there. That doesn't need to be all exposed. We'll kind of go in between here. That doesn't need to, need to be exposed either. Now this is just extra precautions. You really don't have to go back with UV mask and, and mask all of this up. It's just something I like to do um, to try to make it look as factory as possible. And also kind of uh, removes the possibility of air when you're installing the chip that something doesn't get shorted together. That shouldn't. All right, so let's see. That should be enough of the UV mask for now. We could go in between here, in between here, and these pads over here, uh, but they're all connected, so it, it really doesn't matter too much if the pads join in under each other like that. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and cure this, and then we'll move on to the next spot of our project. Now I'm going to be curing it with a just the UV lamp, um, you know, battery operated from Quanli. Uh, that's one of my favorites, so we'll go ahead and use that, and that takes about 30 seconds to a minute. Alright, so now that that's cured, what we're going to go ahead and do, uh, we are going to look for these missing pads and uh, see exactly what needs to be replaced. So let's count here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pads that are missing. So we'll just run through the um, board view and see what is needed and what's not needed. Um, I believe this is the right one. No, this is 923. We need 850. That's this one. All right. So actually, that was right the first time. So let's re-rotate that. And we will go to this CD3215, the one we are working on currently. Um, and we will see that the these two pads on the left side, um, or go back to OBS, um, you'll see that these two pads over here are going to be needed. Let's see what they are connected to. I haven't made a video in a year and already I forgot how to work OBS on my laptop or uh, my computer at the same time. So we have four down. So yeah, one, two, three, four. So those pads um, are important. They connect to PVH or PHV and TA3G hots. Um, so we actually should be able to run, um, if we hop back over the microscope, we should be able to actually run, just jump these two empty pads from either this pad here or this pad here because those are two existing. And if we actually check with our multimeter, let me just connect my multimeter really quick, and we put it in diode mode, what we can do is check these pads to see if they have any um, any uh, reading and they don't. This one's OL and this one's OL, which that's okay because that actually might just mean that there's uh, they get their reading from the board. So what we'll do otherwise is we will see uh, where they connect to. So if we go back over to the um, board view here and we say, okay, these four pads should connect to this resistor right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go on the board and just see if I have continuity between this resistor and these pads. And if you listen, you can hear my multimeter, I do. All right, so those pads are okay. So what I can do is, I, if I want to, I can just jump these two pads to that one and that will work. But I might not even have to do that uh, because these two pads may be enough. Now I still am going to do it. It's just better practice to do it. Um, but it's not always needed depending on the situation, all right? So let's go ahead and move uh, and check this pad here and see if that one needs to be done. And that one is a no stuff, so we don't have to do that one. Um, the one, uh, 
these two down here are no stuff and we can actually see this one is a stuff and this one is a stuff because you can see the trace right here for that one and the tr uh, trace right there for that one. All right, so really all we're gonna need to do is uh, replace those two pads on the bottom and then the two pads on the left. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Let me grab some of our jumper wire. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, we could use these instead of the jumper wire because these are pretty nifty too. They actually make the pads underneath. So let's see. We'll grab one of those and just put it over here. And you can see that pad, if it'll stop jumping around, is damn near the exact size of the pads on the board. So that'll work perfect. So now what we need to do is just get a drop of flux, the opposite of Rossman, just a drop of it. Um, and we'll grab this little thing by its tail and attach it. Maybe we'll attach it. Come on, be easy, be easy with Ginger. There we go. Perfect, I actually could go up just a little bit. So we're gonna redo that just because I didn't like the way it looked. So we're gonna move it up just like that. There we go, that's where we want it. All right, so now we're gonna take our Q-tip we are going to clean up the area, bam, just like that. And then we're going to take our little blade, where'd my little blade go, there it is, and cut off the tail. Bam, we don't need that anymore, get out of here. Alright, so that one's in place. Now we will do, come on, get right where I want you, perfect. Now we'll do one more next to its brother, we'll go ahead and put a little bit of flux there. Grab another one of these. All right. Kind of put that one in place there. Perfect. And we will go ahead and solder that one too. Just like that. All right. And again, we're going to try to put this in the perfect position on the board. Just like that. And again, once again, cut off the tail. Perfect. And we will clean up our mess. All right, that's looking better. Perfect, all right. So now we have repaired those two pads. All right, and now we just got to do these two. I'm not going to do the same method I just did with the uh, with the uh, two down on the bottom there. Uh, I'm simply just going to lay a jumper for those two. Um, if I could find the tail of one of them, I would just use that. But I seem to have already lost the tails on my desk somewhere. Uh, so we'll just get some jumper wire. No big deal. All right, so pull out a piece here. Probably way too long for this, but uh, that's me. If anything, I waste so much jumper wire because I make them way too long. All right, so again, a dab of flux, and we are just gonna tap this one. Come on, stick. There you go, just like that. And we're gonna bring it up here. We're gonna cut our tail off, just like that. We don't need that anymore. All right, that's looking real good. I'm just going to kind of form this up. And we will, again, clean up our flux. And we will just cut off the excess here. And get that little piece out of there. Perfect. All right, that looks good. All right, now we're going to come in with our UV again because we're going to kind of make these a little bit more solid, right? Not that they're not pretty solid the way they are, but we're going to go ahead and use a drop of UV over here to cover up this little guy. All right, and then we will use just another tiny drop on this one over here. 
right, just like that. And then we're just gonna leave that one alone. We're gonna leave that one the way it is. Uh, we're not gonna mess with it at all. So we're gonna go ahead and go at UV and cure that. Now while that's doing that, let's go ahead and research those other components that were missing that I pointed out before. So let's see what those are. Take you with me, there we go. And so if we look here, the first one that was up missing up in that top right corner is a capacitor for USB-C TACC2. So if you don't know what that means, don't worry, I'm about to tell you. USB-C, it's kind of exactly how it describes USB-C, the port that you plug into the MacBook, right? Um, TA, it's a, an assignment because there's four ports on a MacBook, right? Each different port has its own letter assignment. TA is that particular port, okay? So, uh, and CC, is pretty much how you plug in that MacBook charger, right? Because USB-C, you can plug in up or down. So CC1 is like down and CC2 is up or vice versa. I actually don't know which one is which. I just know CC is up and down direction, okay? So USB TA CC tells you, hey, that is the way that the port is being plugged in. And if that line is messed up, yeah, that could stop the MacBook from working. You better believe it um, because it's Apple. Why not, man? Um, so that could be an issue but it's a capacitor so i highly doubt that's any type of issue there um so let's go ahead and see what else is missing from the board it was this little resistor down here which is upc ta dbg3 right um so what does that mean so it i'm looking at that as upc I honestly don't know UP. I, I don't know what that one means, but TA again the direct uh, the the assignment of which port it is and DBG3 that tells me debug more than likely, right? Uh, a lot of this is playing word games, so it, it debug three. So I that and that it doesn't go anywhere else on the board. I I can't imagine that being a problem, but you know it's Apple, so probably it is, and it's a resistor. Even though it connects just straight to ground, it could be a signal resistor saying, uh, you know, telling the chip to turn on or turn on into debug mode or whatever it is. But it definitely needs to be there. And if we look at the schematic, just to confirm, it needs to be there. Um, you can see that that resistor is actually a pull down resistor to ground. So it pulls this data line to ground. All right, so that's what that means. So we're definitely gonna have to put that back. Uh, and let's see, was there anything else missing? Let's switch back to the board view. Yes, there was this data choke here, right? So this data choke is definitely gonna be important. We're definitely gonna need to put that back or else the MacBook won't work. So we're gonna go ahead and put these two components back. We're gonna leave that capacitor off for now. We don't think that's gonna be an issue. And uh, then we'll put the CD3215 back on the board itself. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. That should be done curing. All right, so we'll put this board, the client board, to the side for a quick minute while we start pulling off components off our donor, donor board. All right, so as you can see, my donor board has seen way better days. and probably not gonna be able to pull too much off of this, but the two components I need to pull, these two right here, don't look like they've been infected, affected by liquid. So we'll go ahead and pull them from this. We'll start with our coil, or not our coil, but our data choke here. Any day now. Any day. This will come up. There we go. Actually, ironically though, this board is one of the ones that is not underfilled, which is kind of rare for this board. Normally they're underfilled, but that CD3215 was not. All right, so we're just gonna put this right up here for a quick second, um, and we are going to add some flux right here on where the data choke goes, Boop. just like that. And then we'll go ahead and grab it and put it into position. And we're gonna let surface tension do its thing here once it gets hot enough. There it goes. Come on, surface tension. Pick up your slack. Let's go. You don't have all day. There we go. That's pretty good. That data choke's in place. And once again, we'll go ahead and clean up our flux. Right before we add new flux for this resistor. And we'll just go ahead and get those pads prepped just like that. They're good to go. And once again, we will go to our donor and pull that resistor. All 
Ah, that's kind of lucky that my donor is hit with liquid all in that area, but the two components I needed were not hit with liquid at all. So that is good. And we will go ahead and set this down just like that. And let surface tension do her thing. I'm on surface tension. You know you want to. There we go. Alright, so now, again, we'll clean up our flux. Alright. Oh, and before I forget, let's go ahead and take care of this resistor that's kind of just hanging on by a thread. What we're just going to do is heat that up and we're going to push it down a little bit. Hopefully, some of that solder will jump out of there. We we'll also have to check if this one over here is no stuff. There we go. Now she's sitting properly. And once again, we'll clean up our flux. Board was a little warm that time on flux cleanup. That's all right. That ain't gonna hurt nothing. All right. Oh, gotta watch. I about to lose a jumper over here. That wouldn't have been good. Alright, so I also want to get rid of some of the excess solder right over here. So what I'll do is I'm going to go ahead and add some flux right there. I'm going to take just a little bit of wick. And grab my iron. Wait for the big one to get hot. Come on, any day now. Yeah, there we go. There we go. That will work. That's ah, starting to look better already. All right. And of course, as we always do, we clean up our flux. And once again, I should have done all this before I laid these jumpers because I am losing them every second. Come on, back to where you were. There you go. All right, so that looks good. So I will still need to straighten this out. This is going to have to be knocked over a little bit. Um, let's real quick check on this component from memory. I believe it's snow stuff, but I am not sure. So let's just hop back over to our board view and schematics and check. So it says this is a resistor. It will search the schematics and see. And right there on the schematics, it says no stuff. So it is not important. So that means we do not care about it. So we will go ahead and forget about that. All right, so our next step is gonna to be to go ahead and install that CD3215. And we will, so the way I do this is I apply hot air to the board first to get it nice and warm. Just like that, get it nice and warm, perfect. And then I'm going to apply flux, and I heat the board up first, that way my flux melts as soon as it touches the board, just like that. That way I'm not using all that extra flux and I'm making as little of a mess as possible. Now I have a brand new CD3215 from Mobile Centric, so that should work fine for us. We'll pop that out of the package. And these should already be reballed, so we don't have to mess with that today. Uh, unless one of the other ones are bad, which they probably will be with that 500 milliamp. So I believe the orientation goes this way, but we'll just double check on the schematic real quick or the board view, and yep, the red dot tells me that's the orientation, so that's the, way that, that's the way that chip sits. And so we'll go ahead and get it in the position that we want it to, which is pretty much already in, and press down on it. And now we will just heat that chip up. And we also got one right here on the bottom. I believe that's also no stuff, but we will check in just a second. That should almost be done. Yep, jump in there a little bit. Yep, that's good to go. We're gonna try just to notch this over, just like that. Perfect, now everything's looking as good as it should. All right, so that, we're gonna call that area done. That's gonna be no stuff for sure, because I remember I just peeled underfill off of that pad, so that's definitely a no stuff resistor. So now let's give this moment, um, if I can talk today. Let's give this board a moment to cool and we'll go ahead and plug in the charger and see if we're still getting that five volt 
500 milliamp draw, which I 100% expect that we will, uh, simply because uh, a missing a CD3215 on the board will not cause a 500 milliamp draw. Now, um, he could, the prior tech could have overheated the board and caused a short on the other CD3215. Uh, that could, would definitely cause a 500 milliamp draw. Uh, but this is kind of the pain uh, about working after somebody else is because you have to fix their mistakes in order to move forward to the initial issue, right? So um, let's go ahead and give this board a moment to cool. And when we come back, we'll go ahead and work on the board. All right, so um, the board should be cool enough. Uh, and while we we're waiting for it to cool, I found my little adapter to plug into the MacBook here and to see what we get. Drum roll, please. Uh, now you guys want to place bets. I am betting we still get a 500 milliamp draw, but let's make sure. Okay, five volt, 164. That is not expected. I'm not gonna lie to you. Check this other port. Let's see why. Oh, there it is. All right, so that port got a 500 milliamp draw. So it was just luck of the draw of which one I plugged it into before that got the 500 milliamp draw. But that's also very, very telling, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because if one port pulls 500 milliamps, but the other ports pull like 167 or 150-ish or whatever in that area, it's very telling. It's pretty much almost guaranteed like that port that you plugged into has got a bad CD3215. Um, but we will go ahead and just check. I'm going to check these other two ports on the other side and see what they get. Um, so this first port gets absolutely nothing. And then the second port uh, gets 500 million as well. So I wonder how many bad CD3215s we have. Maybe we just have one. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and dive in. So now here's what we got. We have one port that draws 167. We have another port on that same side that draws 500 milliamp. And on the other side of the MacBook, we have one port that draws absolutely nothing. And then we have a port that draws um, 500 milliamp. So um, we will see what we get. But now what we're gonna do is we're going to diode a mode around each CD3215 and see what we get. So let's go ahead and get started. So I'm going to start with that first side. Ooh, I'm gonna start with that first side and that had the 500 milliamp draw and i'm just kind of diode probe around it we're not going to get into anything too specific we're just kind of kind of quick probe for shorts because that's what we suspect the issue is okay that's that sounds like it's short but it's showing me like 0.78 or 0.078 which tells me that that's probably not short that's probably just got a little bit of residual power left from when i just plugged it in that line is probably not short but we can always double check that by simply um, plugging it in and seeing if we get power on that line. If we get power on that line, it means it's not short. Or we could wait ten, five to 10 minutes and diode mode it again, and then it would be within range. That's normal for if you have like a lower resistance line, like it's normally supposed to be like 150, 200-ish in that area. Uh, when you plug power into it and then you plug it in and immediately test, you can get something like 0.078 or a, a much lower reading. Uh, so it's not always reliable in that sense. But let's go ahead and continue diode moding around that uh, CD3215, that got down here, we get a normal reading, and look, okay, see we test that one again, and now it's a reading about 168, so that's good, and we'll test over here, and we get a short, this is showing, it's kind of all over the place, it's like anywhere from 0.005 to 0.30, which is a short, so now we're going to hop over the board view and see what that is. I believe we, it's on this side over here, and it's this capacitor here. Okay, so what is that? That is PP3V3UPCXBLDO. All right, so that is telling me, really, that connects to a bunch of stuff over here. That's the SPI for the CD3215s. It's got a capacitor, a couple resistors that are attached to it, and it goes to other lines. And it's also attached to the CD3215, just this one, and a couple of other resistors. So my bet, um, just from experience now, is that the short itself is caused by the CD3215 and nothing else on that line. Now, if you didn't have that experience and you didn't know, uh, what you could simply do is an inject voltage, 3.3 volts into that line, and see what gets hot. Uh, we're going to go based off my experience this time and say that it's the CD3215. So we're gonna go ahead and remove that and replace it and see what happens, all right? So let's go ahead and get started doing that. And again, we're gonna lower my uh, hot air to about 250 over 70. We're gonna get my 007 blade ready. 
and we are going to scratch away once it gets hot enough. That should be about hot enough. I really hate underfilled CD3215s. It makes a job that should only take five minutes, take 15, because Apple. Why? They said, well, you might get the MacBook wet, and we really want to protect these charging chips. Well, it doesn't matter all the stuff around the charging chip that's needed for the MacBook to work properly. That can get wet. But we don't want these chips to get wet for whatever reason. So we'll go ahead and replace them. And we're not going to do it on every MacBook. We're just going to do it on a few. All right, so now we got that all that underfill removed from around it. Um, normally, I remove these without a scope. I just kind of flip my blade in there and then uh, heat. But since you guys want to see what I'm doing, I'm going to do it this way. And hopefully, I don't break anything. Let's see. So I'm, I'm applying heat, and I'm gently lifting up on the CD, and I'm just waiting for it to pop. Oop, like that. I lost the fuse there. Oop, put that fuse back, and the resistor almost lost. All right, but that's no big deal. All right, we'll put those things back. All right, so first let's correct what we broke. Oop, a little bit of flux there. A little bit of flux there. And we're going to go ahead and put these things back to where they belong. Yeah, that resistor went back by itself, and there goes that uh, filter, or fuse, whatever you want to call it. And those things are back in place. We'll clean up that flux. And get out of there, flux. Bam. All right. So now we are going to add flux. We are going to add solder. Come on, all right, get hot, there we go. Boop. And just add some solder to the board. All right, that should be good. Now we will clean up our flux, or the majority of it anyway. So now we're going to add flux again. And why do you, Dustin, add, uh, clean your flux before you add flux every single time? Well, it's just for the clean, cleanliness, cleanliness sake. I like to keep the board as clean as possible so I can give it to the client back as clean as possible. So now we're going to go ahead and wick, excuse me, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> wick this here. Wicking, wicking, wicking. Let's not tear any pads. Which is something I will probably do because it's underfilled. And I'm trying to be real rough with it to get that underfill out as well as wick these pads. Alright, so there we go. That's good. Alright. Wow, did I really pull two pads? Those must have been no stuff. They were no stuff anyway. They were a lot easier to tear. I'm not worried about them too. Those will be fine. They, those don't go into anything anyway. They are not important. And again, we are lowering our air, or our temperature down, so we can clean up the rest of this underfill. That's looking pretty good. A uh, new CD3215 will fit there. Now let's go ahead, before we do anything else, let's go ahead and continue. Let's test to see if it's still short. Oh, the sweet sound of silence. That, that reading is about 300 and rising, and it's rising rapidly because the board is so hot. You get a lower reading when the board is hot. All right, so that is ready for a new CD3215. Let me pull one out of my binder. I should probably pull a few out or just pull the entire bag out at this point simply because 
I am sure we're going to need more than one. So I'm just going to pull the entire bag out. <clears throat> So a real easy way to tell on a CD3215, if you don't have the board view or the schematic to tell uh, which uh, what, what's the orientation, you see that little absence of a dot right here? That That is where the A1 is on the uh, CD3215s. It's only on the CD3215s that it's that way, so don't go to another chip and be like, oh look, there's a missing gap, that must be A1. That's not the case, but on these, it is, so it's very easy, you don't even need the board view for that. And I'm just kind of cleaning up some of the extra. Get the board hot there and apply our flux nice and gently like I was just doing before. And pour C3215. Alright, so. We are going to let surface tension do its thing one more time. And then once again, this is not going to fully fix the board at this point because on the other side we had one port that didn't draw anything and a port that drew uh, 500. So um, likely we'll still have more, board, more work to do this board, but this should correct this side of the board and make it so we have uh, 5 volts, like 167, somewhere around there on both both uh, ports on this side of the board and then we'll hop on the other side uh, but for right now we got to wait for the board to cool before we can continue to test it all right so board should be cool enough so we will go ahead and plug in our little adapter plug in the board and good we get it. so first we get like 560 milliamps then it jumps to like 160 milliamps then it jumps to 256 milliamps and just kind of hangs at the 256 milliamp um, I'm gonna plug in the other port just to make sure we get the same thing and we more than likely will we do, and what this tells me is that, hey, this side is likely okay, this side is likely functioning. Now, it's still not gonna jump up to the uh, 20 volt mark and to the start booting mark uh, because it needs all four CD3215s to work properly in order for the board to turn on and function um, or to start charging uh, and, and really need to plug in the charger for it to start turning off the battery, so really for the board to function, right? Uh, so what we'll do now is now that we know that one side is healthy, we're gonna swap to the other side and see what we get, all right? So uh, we're gonna plug this in again on this side and see, do we get any change? Okay, so on one port, we still get uh, dead nothing. It doesn't even turn on my meter. And on the other port, now we are getting that same uh, 60, 126, 160, 200, and it's just kind of hanging there. So that's telling me that we should be good except for one more CD3215. And if I was a betting man, uh, we I would say it's on the one that I haven't done yet, uh, but we don't know, we still got to test. So if I have the board facing me like this, it's this bottom port that doesn't pull anything. So how do we determine which, uh, what, this port leads to what CD3215. I'll show you now. So let's go ahead and hop over to the board view. All right, so we are working on this side of the board with this uh, port over here. And so um, this is going to be your 20 volt inline for one of the ports. And this is going to be your 20 volt inline for another one of the ports. So if I'm plugged into this bottom port here, Okay, and then it, this is going to be the 20 volt inline I'm looking for, which tells me that it's this CD3215, this top one that I have not touched yet. Remember, this bottom was the one. Bottom one was the one that was removed, and uh, kind of that, that area was demolished, and we have already fixed that, or we hope we have fixed that, right? So now we've got to look at this CD3215, and, and hope that this is our issue. So we're gonna do um, some probing around this one and see what we get with our multimeter. So we will hop back over uh, to our microscope camera. And let's probe around. Good. Oh, oh no, that's 0.99. Again, that's just gonna be the same thing as we discussed before. So that's gonna be good, and that's good. That's good. That's good, that's good. All right, that's good, that's good. Everything seems to be good, right? Um, let's check the fuse, make sure that's good. That is good. 
So everything seems to be working right over here. So this just may be, what we could do now is probe, see if we're getting any voltages over here. Um, because with, a, with nothing happening on my amp meter, I would assume that I would have something short. So let's see, am I getting, I'm not even getting five volts. All right. All right, so what I'm gonna go ahead and do next is I'm just gonna replace it. Um, I could, in all fairness, go through and check my LDOs to see if my LDOs were there, but I can tell you that they're not going to be because my five volt inline isn't there. So let me show you what I mean. Um, I should have five volts right now coming from this pad, which comes right from the port to this fuse, and I don't even have that. Now, I've seen that before, and normally what it's caused by is a short on this line. This line right here is short, and normally it's caused by this piece here, this MOSFET here that causes it. Um, but like I said, normally this is short. That is not the situation here. Uh, I've also seen this before with just a bad CD3215, um, and likely I'm thinking since the, the area right below, hold on, wait. Actually, this looks kind of cracked, but I don't know. That could just be deep scratches from the prior tech. Um, uh, I'm assuming here since it, the CD, this CD3215 is right below it, I'm assuming that he overheated it and caused it to float, right? Uh, so that that's the assumption I'm working off right now because if you don't even have a CD3215 on the board, it will also draw nothing. Uh, so I'm thinking that this is just floated. Now, instead of actually um, taking it off and, and cleaning all the underfill off the chip and reballing the chip, these things are like 10 or 15 bucks. I can tell you I'm gonna make way more now on this repair. I'm not worried about saving that 10 or 15 bucks. I'm more worried about the X, you know, the, the speediness of the repair. And it's just a lot faster to put a new chip on it, especially if it's questionable and you're not sure. Uh, it, it would be a different situation if I said, hey, I'm 100% sure that this chip is just over or floated and there's joint solder balls underneath it. It'd be a different situation, but I don't know that for sure. I'm kind of making an assumption or making a guess. Uh, so, um, I'm just gonna go ahead and replace it all together. So once again, we will turn our hot air down to that temperature that we remove underfill with, and we will do the same exact thing that we did on the other side of the board. Hopefully we will knock less components off this time and not more, right? That's our goal. Knock as least components off the board as possible. And I don't care about ripped NC pads or not connected pad, nobody cares about those. Those guys can go home. Nobody cares about those guys. All right, so we'll turn our hot air back up to operating temperature. I'm try to get my blade under there. And again, I normally do this without a scope with my hot air directly above the chip, uh, but I'm trying to have you guys see. So I can't really do that. I gotta look at it, do it a different way. bam and bam all right get this chip out of here get out of here all right so once again we are going to add a little bit of flux or yeah flux and then we're going to add a little bit of solder little bit of solder a little bit of flux odd See, now I'm singing you guys. You, you, you say you want me to make videos, but in my videos I sing and do all that stuff that I know nobody wants to hear, especially when you're just getting over a cold. I'm definitely not in my top singing voice right now. All right, now we got our wick. We're gonna wick up these pads and hopefully not tear any pads because we're being rough because we're trying to uh, scrape away underfill. Mm -mm. I don't know why the guy who invented the underfill thought that he should do that. Alright, clean up our flux once again. Alright, now we're going to go ahead with our lower temperature. And clean up all this extra underfill. Oh. 
tiny this is. There we go. Man, that should be good. And then we will grab another CD3215 out of the bag of CD3215s. Get her opened up here. And again, we will match up the empty dot with the actual dot so it will sit like that. Just put that there off to the side for now. Grab our hot air. Heat up the board again. And just a little bit of flux. Just like that. Not too much, but just the right amount. And we will install this CD3215 like that. Now to the beauty part of the other guy. I didn't see any join pads under that CD3215, but I didn't really look, but I feel like that would have drawn my attention if I would have seen that. And that chip jumps, so that's going to be in place. We'll knock it on the side too. Bam, just like that. And once again, we will wait for the board to cool. Alright, so the board should be cool enough now. We will go ahead and connect our adapter. And at this point, I am fully expecting the board to work, but we will see. Alright, we get to 60, what we're expecting, the 250. Come on, jump, jump. Oh, she's not. She's stuck at the 256. All right, let's 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 check all these ports, make sure they're all acting the same way. And we're, then we're going to go back to that first port that we worked on that had all that damage. And we're going to check that out and see what happens there. But first, we want to make sure all of our ports are pulling and they're not pulling something stupid. And the first two on that side were pulling properly. The first port, that the one we just did now, it looks like it's pulling properly. That's good. That's good. And the one that we did first looked like it's pulling properly. All right, so we're still having an issue, and likely it's in our CD3215 circuit, uh, but we still need to do a bit more research. So let's do that. So we're, first we're going to hop over here. It, oops, so you guys can see me. And this is going to be the one that we initially messed with. Now this has, like I said, I don't know, where's my tweezers so I can point. I don't know if this is like leftover flux damage or, or liquid damage, um, but definitely something to look at. Uh, this is that capacitor that we said that probably wasn't needed, uh, but it might be. I'm not thinking it is though. Um, but I really don't want to sit here all day and think that that could be the issue. So what I'm going to do is, yeah, I'm just going to go ahead and replace that. I'm just trying to see if there's anything else floated or barely hanging on over here also. Uh, I really don't think that one capacitor will cause it. But I'll tell you what, let's just go ahead and, and, and replace it just to make sure. Be on the safe side, I guess. All right, so we got that little bit of flux there. Now we'll grab our donor. Oh, of course, and our donor's pretty much corroded away um I don't want to use that let me let me go ahead and grab another one another donor board here this one should work let's see yeah that one doesn't have any liquid damage there perfect And again, I'm not thinking this is the issue, really. I, I would be very surprised if it was. Uh, but I don't want to sit here die, trying to diagnose the issue and it actually be this capacitor that I failed to put back. There we go. So right now, the only CD3215 that we have on the board that is the same is on the other side. Um, and it would not be the first time that I have seen all of the CD3215s be bad. Um, but we will check it out in just a minute. Alright, we're going to let this board cool off a second. 
and uh, see if we get our 20 volts now. And if we do, then I will have learned something that I kind of already knew that the CC circuit can definitely mess up the entire board or make it so it doesn't charge at all on any of the ports. Uh, but I just didn't think that a missing capacitor could. But let's see, it might not. Uh, we'll go ahead and let the board cool and then we'll continue. Uh, all right, that didn't work, uh, unfortunately. So now what we're going to do is we are going to uh, go ahead and go back to the original CD that we were working on, the one where that uh, area was a mess. We're gonna measure around that area and see if we see anything that's, uh, that we're gonna check voltage wise, right? So we're gonna make sure everything has the proper voltage and all of that stuff. So let's go ahead and get started on that. So uh, to do that, I'm gonna go ahead and plug the MacBook in to the side of the, uh, that, that we have a feeling it is causing our issue and we're gonna go and do some voltage readings um, so let's go ahead and do that oh come on scope work why isn't my scope working all right there's my microscope working so let's go ahead and plug this in and take some voltage measure measurements all right so I'm gonna be looking for the LDOs and just kind of measuring them real quick there should be the 3v5v, 3v3, alright, the 1v1 LDO is missing, uh, or very low, um, so we are going to check the ROM and see, I should have pretty much 3v3 all around here, there's two pads, or two, two points that will be lower than 3v3, that will be like lower than half a volt, uh, that's normal, oh looky here, so here we have 2.6 volts, so let's take a look over on the schematic and see what we should have. And that's over here. This, so it's UPC, TASPI, MISO. And so let's right click on that and search and see what we should have on the schematic. And we will just kind of skip to where it's generated. Come on. Actually, I think that's my problem. Let's try this one more time. Oh, Jesus, stop. It keeps skipping. We're just going to do it this way. Click over here. That's what I want to see. Perfect. Okay, so now we will jump to where it's supposed to go right here. So it looks like this is brought up to a 3v3 line through a 3.3k resistor. Uh, so this should be about 3.3 volts. Let's make this sure this resistor is in spec. That's this one here, okay. So we're just gonna change our uh, multimeter to the ohms mode or just see how, uh, check the resistance on this resistor. And we have, oh, you guys can't see. Just trust that I'm measuring it and it's showing it as 3.3K. All right, so that means that something is pulling down that voltage, all right? So the voltage should be up here at 3.3, it's down here at 2.6, that means something's bringing it down, right? Uh, it, it could either be that or some uh, the resistor is not effectively pulling it up, uh, but if the resistor is 3.3K and the line that, it's, that, that brings it up is at the right voltage of 3.3 volts, then the resistor is not gonna be the issue and something is bringing it down. So how do we determine what's bringing it down? There, there's a couple of different ways. Once again, we could inject voltage and, and see if there's anything getting hot or anything like that. Um, I'm gonna do it a little different though. I'm going to remove uh, a couple of resistors and see if um, what's pulling it down, right? I have a suspicion that it is going to be this chip here, okay? Um, and that's just from experience when I see that line low. Normally, it's this chip that's causing it. But I can confirm that, and uh, here's how we're, gonna, we're just going to do remove this resistor. So uh, I'm going to bring you over to the screen first to show you what I'm talking about. Um, so this resistor here, I believe it is. Let's double check. Yeah, so it's this resistor here. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the line that's currently at 2.6. That should be about 3.3 volts. Uh, I'm going to remove, uh, this is that line here, and this is the line that is going to that chip that I was just talking about. I'm going to remove this resistor to see if it brings that line back up to 3.3 volts. So we'll go ahead and do that now. Just, just like that. That way we don't lose her later. 
So we just brought it off the line and now we're going to give it a few minutes to cool and then we will test and see if that line has uh, the correct voltage now. Alright, so we're going to just plug the board back in, put our multimeter back on voltage mode and we are testing. Let's see, again testing this line right here and it is at now 3.25 which is very close to the 3.3 mark which is what I would expect. Alright, so that tells me that that chip is an issue. So what we're going to do is just put this resistor back. Just a drop of flux there is all we need. Perfect. All right, that jumped back into place. Now we'll go ahead and clean up that little bit of flux that we had there. Perfect, that's looking good. All right, well, that should be good there. All right, now what we're gonna do is we're gonna remove the chip from the board. And see if we fix the MacBook. So what we're going to do is we're going to remove the chip, we're going to clean up the pads here, and then we're going to go ahead and test again because this is not a chip you need for uh, the computer to turn on. What you need it for is like USB communications, like uh, communicating with flash drives, mouse, etc. Um, so that's what this chip does. So it is not needed for functionality, or power functionality anyway. Wait for the iron to get hot. Any day now. Beep. There we go. Now this MacBook had for that we could confirm two CDs that were bad. One CD wasn't on the board. Um, so quite a bit of, of damage to this MacBook. Come on. All right, now we will go ahead and clean that up. We're not trying to do it perfect just because we are going to have to install a chip there back again uh, if this works. Alright, so that board's kind of cool already so we can go ahead and reattach the charger and see if it works. And we'll see if we get the proper voltage there now. Interesting, I'm getting a flat zero zeros, all zeros on that port, which is not what I would expect. Alright, let's see what I'm, I've just plugged in the other port, let's see what I'm getting over here. Uh, nothing. Not a damn thing. I'm getting like 0 .092, which is less very much less than what we need. What's curious though is that the top it is not pulling anything. All right, so that is very curious. I wonder if my ROM's messing with me. So I'm gonna go ahead. I'm gonna just replace the ROM here and see what happens. Maybe that that uh, that partial short from that chip hurt this ROM. So we're gonna take it off and replace it and see what happens. I'm just going to put that off to the side because if it's not the reason that we're having issues, I don't want to replace it, right? Um, I want to keep the original ROM on there. So we're going to go ahead and just um, prep this for a new one. Let's see what we get out of it. Uh, we'll put this board to the side and pull out our donor board. Uh, which 
donor board had the least amount of liquid? I think it was this one. Right there, yeah, okay. Let's see what we get if we put this ROM on here. And again, this is the ROM for the CD3215s. surface tension kicking in. I'm going to remove the heat, let the solder uh, cool, and then press down and press down just like that. Alright, that should be a good connection. Just again wait for that to cool. Perfect. And we will clean it up a little bit here. Board cool for a second and see what we get.